For this first video, we need to start with the very basics. I've got a big fancy node graph going on here. As we can see, if we start at the beginning, it's a variety of different effects that are all run off different vector mappings. We have a source group here that has a variety of UV and object vectors to let us do whatever we want for this project. And everything else is downstream of that. We have sparkles and lines and image textures and gradients and all of this other stuff, and it all runs off these various different vectors. I'm not using all the ones I've set up here, but I've included them and will be explaining them all in case people have different needs for whatever setup they want to make. Let's take a closer look at what these vectors are and what the group does. Come down here to a simpler version. First of all, our group has a left and right mask, which is essential for doing different things on the left and right eye, or even properly mirroring effects. And then we have a variety of different vector mappings. We have UV mappings, object mappings, and what I'm calling object UV, which is object coordinates, but adjusted to let you use them with image textures like a UV map. So we can take a look and we see we have mirrored. And then we can also have a texture where it's not mirrored and a texture that extends all the way across both eyes. And then textures where it's attached to an iris object on either side. And also same thing, but for the pupil. And then this one allows us to take a image texture and is the exact same thing but works with image textures. If we take a look inside the group, it's pretty complicated at first glance, but actually there's not as much going on here as you think, because this, 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 and this are all distinct areas. So it's actually four simple things that happen to be sharing a group for organizational purposes. Our group also has a variety of controls on it if you want to make adjustments. And of course, the inputs are various objects used for the different mappings. Now, before we get into the details of how exactly to build this group and what it all does, let's talk some basic theory first. I've got a new file with a plane, a material, and just a few nodes. The plane comes with a UV unwrap, so let's take a look at that. We can see that if we rotate or scale the plane in object mode or in edit mode, it makes no difference at all. But if we use object coordinates, first of all, the center of where our gradient is has changed. And if we rotate things in object mode, everything is fine. But in edit mode, suddenly the gradient isn't turning. The texture is no longer staying mapped to the geometry. And that is because object coordinates are projected. When you're working with UV coordinates, where things go is established in a certain way. We can pop open to our UV editor window, switch this into geometry so we can see everything. And where things are is determined by the unwrap. So here we have X and we have Y. And this is zero, zero. This is one, one. This is zero, one, one, zero, etc. I don't actually remember which order it's in. But we can know that whatever we put in this bottom left box is also going to end up in the bottom left box of this because it is defined by the UV unwrap. Object coordinates define where things go differently. In this case, the center of the object coordinates is literally the origin point of the object. If we look here, We've still got X and Y. That's a terrible Y, but... But instead of zero being down here, zero is actually here. This is zero on X and Y. And actually, if we go into edit mode, and we start duplicating this and rotating it, we can see that no matter what the geometry is doing, that gradient is in the same place. And that's kind of the point of object textures. In fact, if we switch over to a sphere, we can even see that these textures are actually 3D. 
can make tons of these, you can kind of see that there's a 3D sphere being projected because it's being projected in both X, Y, and Z. This can be a bit similar to understand if we grab ourselves an empty object. And we're gonna use for object the empty. So now we can see that by moving the empty, we move the projection point. And if you imagine that there's a sphere around this empty, which is doesn't take much imagination if we change it to a sphere, then we can see that as we move it down, less of the sphere is appearing as we get away from the center of projection. And actually, rotating it matters too, but that's hard to see, so we'll scale it first, and now you can see that as we rotate it, different amounts of it appear. So the core idea of this entire method of making eyes is that you have an object and you project a sphere from it, and the entire eye is made out of the sphere and the position is controlled by the sphere. So what exactly determines the size of the texture projected by an object? On a UV texture, the projection determines what part of the object the texture affects. So if you scale or transform the object, it's always going to stay the same. Texture scales with the object. For the object projected texture, the texture stays the same size regardless of the scale of the object being projected on. Earlier, when we scaled the object projected text, it did change because then we are using the object itself. The, the same object was determining the texture as it's being projected on, so it scales with it in object mode, but not in edit mode. But now that we're using this empty, then even as we scale this object, it doesn't change anything. Of course, if we scale the empty, then it does. Let's make this way larger. And however large we make the empty is how large the texture is. But how large is that? Well, this plane starts off as two by two. So the distance from the center to the edge is one. And this empty by default is actually doesn't have dimensions because empties do not have dimensions. But it's still actually two by two if we're looking at the size of the object with the default size. So by default, the size of the empty texture is still one blender unit. So as we make this larger, we can see that this is still taking up two by two blender units total because the radius is one blender unit. It's important to understand this dimension issue in order to work with different procedural textures. For example, if we look at this linear, gradient, we can see that it hits pure white at essentially the edge of this empty, which is one blender unit. And if we scale it down, it's still hitting pure white at the edge, regardless of what we scale that to. But something like this spherical gradient, what it's actually doing is from zero to one is going from white to black, but also from zero to negative one. A useful thing you can do is break down the different vectors by separating the x, y, z. If we look here, we can see that x is the same as that linear gradient we just looked at, and y is the same in the up direction, and z is doing nothing right now because our plane is only on x and y, but if we rotate it, there's z. So that still exists. Let's make another transformation to understand what exactly we're looking at. Black, of course, is zero, but everything below black is also zero. And we actually have other data hiding here that we can't see. And of course, white is one, and things above white, uh, above one are still there and are still white. We can use the map range node to actually take a peek under the hood. That's the same so far. But now let's take a look at this gradient if instead of being from 0 to 1, it was minus 1 to 1. Now our gradient starts at minus 1 and runs all the way through to 1. We've made it more like, I guess, the UV version, where the gradient starts on this side and it's on the other. If this plane was one by, well, 2 by 2, like the sphere, then it's going to look exactly like our UV version of the linear gradient now. In fact, if we take a look at the UV's X on its own, there we go, same thing. And of course, Y in the vertical direction. Of course, this only works if there's actually data below zero to look at. If we take, say, this linear texture 
and look at it, we can see it's the same as this. But now if we put X through the map range, it's scaling it. But if we put the linear texture through the same thing, we're getting a different result. Let's blow this up a bit so we can see when remapping X, it's giving us zero at minus one. But here, what has happened? Well, there was nothing below zero. The texture has already made it just zero to one. So if you remap it, that's the same thing as dividing it in two, multiplying it by 0.5. So it's just made the areas that used to be black 0.5 gray, and that's it. There's no more data to be revealed by the map range. For this reason, there's a big difference between making a gradient with the linear gradient procedural texture and just using the separated x, y, and z, and that'll come up later. So we can transform our texture by transforming the empty. And we can rotate and scale and move it, of course. But we can also make changes to the texture in the node itself. And there's a few ways to do that. The first is the mapping node. And you can look up the mapping node for more detail on all this, but it has several types. And I'm going to mostly be using the texture type. So we won't go into an explanation of what all those are, because that would be another whole bit of the video. But with this, we can move our texture compared to its original origin point, including forward and backwards in depth. And we can rotate it. Of course, you can't see that unless we give it some scale. So let's do that. And then we can see the rotation. If we rotate our axis, that's actually different for the camera. So we can make changes like that and then still move the origin point and it's all relative transforms to that. This can also be done for UV textures, of course. Then there's also some transforms that can be made with the vector map node. And this node can do a whole lot of stuff. If we start adding things, that's the same thing as using the location on the mapping node or there's all these other things, some of which are simple, some are very complicated. The scale node is handy. Now notice on the scale node that as your number gets larger, it gets smaller. Whereas on the mapping node, on texture mode, lower numbers makes it smaller. In point mode, larger numbers make it smaller. That's part of one of the differences that we're not going to get into. But you keep that in mind that different things are going on depending on the details of the math. Another thing to know about is that there could be some foibles in how some of these textures work under the hood. For example, I mentioned that this sphere texture is actually 3D, but let's flip over to the radial texture. Everything's fine until we rotate our plane by 90 degrees. And then what are we even looking at? Well, the problem is that the radial texture is calculated around the z-axis. So right now, it doesn't really work because we're looking at x and z with y as depth. If it was calculated around the y-axis, we'd see it, but we've kind of cut the z-axis off. We can solve this with our mapping by rotating it by 90 degrees around the x. And then the radial texture gives us even more trouble if we go to use it with the UV map. It's just not there for some reason, right? And rotating it by 90 degrees doesn't do us any good. In fact, we can see there's a little bit of something there. And that rotation made even that disappear. So what's going on? Well, this brings us to our major difference between UV and object coordinates. As I mentioned, objects center the texture with zero being the origin point of the object, whereas in UVs, zero, zero is the bottom left corner. So if we move this a bit, bump it up 0.5 and 0.5, then suddenly our radial texture was there. So it was actually there the whole time. It was just down here, so we couldn't, we were only seeing this quadrant of it. If we undo that, you can see that pretty clearly. And this is the major difference between object and UV textures that we're going to have to change if we want to work with them. So luckily that change was pretty simple. It's just 0.5 on X and Y, and our UV images line up with our object images. But what if we want to use the object coordinates to control an image so that an image texture would move with our object 
that can be done too. First, let's get ourselves an image. Let's make one quickly. It doesn't have to be very nice. Head over into texture paint mode. And let's just get X and Y. And this is zero. And this is one, one. And now we can test with that. So if we plug our object's coordinates in, it doesn't work until we set the rotation. And now it's there. So we have a couple of issues. First, it's there at the wrong size and repeating four times. And second, why wasn't it working with the plane rotated? So first of all, the reason it's there four times is because this is set on repeat. If we set the clip, it only appears once. So that's its true location. And this is properly moving with our object and scaling with it and all that. It's just in the wrong place. So we need to move it with a mapping node. But how much? It needs to be centered. This needs to be in the bottom corner and it needs to get twice as large, at least for this object. So we'll grab a mapping and we can move it around. If we move it here, now it's centered properly, and now we need to scale it. So I'll grab this node just so that we can affect all three scales at once. And now as we adjust this up, it's scaling from the wrong point because it's scaling from the bottom corner. So if we have it at times two scale, which is right, we actually need to move it even more. But of course, if we change our object size, now that isn't correct anymore. For this object that's two by two, we need times two scale. But let's say our object, if we scale it down by 50% to one by one, now we need a scale of one and we need the size to only, the offset of the location to only be 0.5. So this is a good time for us to turn this into a group. So we'll grab these two nodes, make a group with control G. So we know that at a scale of 1, we want the offset to be minus 0.5 on x and y. So we can grab a math, multiply minus 0.5, put that to 1. That is our scale input. And we'll need a combined x, y, z. Put that into the x and y. And then this scale also goes in there. Let's grab some reroutes to clean it up a bit. And there we go. Now we have group. We'll keep that. And now we can see as we adjust the scale, it stays centered and scales up. And if we change the scale of our object, now it's two by two, so we set it to two, and everything's working great. So the next problem, why does it get messed up when we rotate our plane into a vertical orientation, which is what we're actually gonna need for the eyes? Well, that's because this is working in X and Y like a UV texture, but we're actually in X and Z as our vertical rotation. So currently it's trying to map it here and here, and since there's no Y dimension and it's flat, it's getting confused and just giving us this white line. So we need to have it use Z as the up axis instead. We can plug this in here to have that movement on Z, but that alone doesn't solve the problem. Now, one solution that you'll see used somewhere, some places, and is sometimes more convenient, is you can just separate and recombine your vector and just put the Z into the Y and swap what's being used. And now it's happy. At least it's happy until we rotate it again. But we'll solve this in a slightly different way that makes it a bit more intuitive and keeps this node group a bit more reusable. And that is, we're gonna give it 90 degree rotation on the X. And of course, if you're rotating the plane in some other way, you would need to give it 90 degree rotation on some other axis. But for this project, we just need this. Now let's make it so that we can make this a control on the group. So we'll combine X, Y, Z, put 90 in X, and that's wrong. What's going on here? Go back to zero and we scrub this a bit we can see it does rotate and it actually hits the proper thing about here 1.6 well what's going on is that this is in degrees 90 degrees and this is just a number and you'd think that whatever number you put here is what you get here but that's not actually the case because this is working in radians 
So if we want to have this work right, we need a math node and convert two degrees, actually two radians from degrees. And we can put our 90 here, plug that in there, and now everything's working right. And this can be our output here. Fill this. Organize the nodes a bit better. And there we go. So to recap, we can use our UV texture and our texture is in the right place, but doesn't respond to the object. Or we can use our object to UV and now it still is in the same place. It looks exactly the same in fact, but it responds to the object's movement and we can scale it and rotate it and whatever we want. That's all for this video. In the next video, we'll be talking about these different types of UV maps here and how to make them either as actual UV maps or make them in the nodes itself. And remember that the entire setup is already available to my tier two patrons through March 2021 and also on Gumroad for a few dollars more. If you want to help me continue making videos, please consider signing up or buying the file. And of course, like, subscribe, and follow me on Twitter. Thanks, and I'll see you next video.